Prato and Rui. <coughs> um, just uh, just uh, good, good morning, members um, uh, and staff. Um, just uh, like to welcome you to the Maru Kaituna meeting. Uh, just a reminder uh, that the meeting is being videotaped and will be available on the Bay of Plenty Regional Council website. Uh, members who are zooming in, uh, if you can keep your cameras on, raise your virtual hand uh, if you wish to speak and um, keep your microphones on mute. Okay, uh, to me, to a So the rules of engagement, I suppose. To me, to Tahi Ake, to me, a Katimata Kamatu, we are not Karakia, a Kahuri Tarako, a Kia Pe Manu, a Katimata Kamatu, we. Uh, you, you have to unmute yourself so we can hear it too. That's a spiritual karaoke, that one, boy. Get <laughs> <laughs> away, get away. You're talking to God. Hi, hi. 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 Okay, just moving straight into our agenda uh, for apologies. Uh, we do have apologies from Commissioner Shad Rolleston and Commissioner Bill Walsley and Karen Thompson. Are there any other? John Scrimmager. Maybe for that. Uh, the apologies. Uh, can I have someone move the apologies? Thank you, Tanya. Second. And sorry, um, Mr. Chair, sorry, oh, you, sorry. you have an um, appointment at 10 a.m., um, but depending on the quorum, I can remain if I'm needed to. I think it's all right now, Tanya. I think we're fine. Top so, yeah. So, yeah. So um, I'll just second that uh, motion in regards to the apologies. Uh, agenda item three, public forum. We don't have any, there's none there uh, for uh, items not on the agenda. Done to date. So moving on, number five, order of business. There's no change to the order of the agenda. Uh, and number six is declaration of conflict of interest for any conflicts of interest in regards to our agenda. Manu? Can I, uh, can I just give a brief explanation of, brief explanation of my view in terms of conflict of interest? I would like to say with, he, with him, with us, and with conflict of interest, there's what's in it for me, what's in it for you, what's in it for us. I'm here on what's in it for us in terms of that I have an interest in Waikaha as well as Africa. money, thank you for that. Uh, just moving to our minutes uh, of the previous meeting. Uh, I assume that the minutes have been read. Okay, I'll have a move and a seconder for the minutes. Uh, Jane, thank you for the move. Second, much more it Matters arising from the minutes. Hold. If those in favour, say aye. Uh, Raise your hand. Okay, against. Okay, carried. Okay, number eight. Uh, it's like a two longer presentation. So we have a 25 minute uh, presentation here. Uh, it's from the Tataka Kai project uh, from Alva Conroy and Hemi O'Callaghan. Uh, I mihi mai ana ki a koutou katoa. I think it's been uh, since about early last year that I last presented to Te Maru Kaitana. Um, at that time, it was just the idea and the vision for this project. Um, we had some cool ideas of what we wanted to do, but at that time, we didn't have any funding. So this is a really um, a neat update of just the work that's underway at the moment, um, as well as what's coming up. 
um, probably a key thing to note is we did receive funding through um, the Western Bay's Community Matching Fund, uh, as well as the Wai Māori. Uh, next slide. Oh, sorry, I have the... Here we go. So just a reminder of, I guess, the purpose of our project. Um, I guess the long-term dream is having more habitats uh, for our freshwater fisheries, our tuna, inanga, koda, kākuhi, watercress, um, as well as, you know, the ability for our people to be, I guess, providing for their own, providing for our marae. And then, of course, the ability for our own couple and iwi to be, um, you know, reconnected with our awa and to be doing our own work, expressing our own um, ways of, as kind of, you know, as kaitiaki um, or our awa. Um, so this has, I guess, multiple benefits, not only for our people, but also for our tonga fish species. Um, and I guess it's no surprise that our, this dream aligns with everything that's within the Kaitina River document as well as the Tiniatuna, the action plan. Um, and as you all know, it, this is one of the, I think, project nine of the Kaitina action plan. Um, our general approach was just to look at, at answering three questions. So we were, we did, we were our freshwater fisheries in the past using research. Um, where are they now? So using um, monitoring. And where do we want to prioritise our efforts? So where are those areas where we might want to um, enhance habitats or establish new habitats for tonga species? Um, along the way, as I've mentioned before, um, it's a, a way to connect our whānau, our hapu, our marae um, to uh, future projects uh, with regards to this, um, this mahi. Now, one thing I wanted to note was just, I guess, the limited scope of of, uh, for the next 12 months. And this is around, in relation to all three of those questions, establishing a way of working, uh, the different ways that we may carry out research, whether it's through um, site visits, interviews. Um, we're going to trial uh, a new, some new methods with our monitoring, which I'll uh, introduce Hemi shortly to talk through. Um, and, and just, you know, build the, um, get the buy-in, connect our people to the project. I mean, in the future, it would be great to see our own people carrying out their own monitoring and their own habitat restoration on their own land. But, you know, I guess it's the baby steps, I guess, is the way to describe it. So work completed today, I mean, uh, so far there was um, a piece of work around uh, collating the, the, the desktop research of what we know already based on uh, information within treaty settlements, existing monitoring data, um, but the bigger one for me was um, forming the my star working group. So that my do is to say the least. And I think that's been the highlight for me over the last six months. Um, I guess our core working group, um, all Fano um, within the, the River Iwi, uh, so Hemi O'Callaghan, who um, I'll introduce shortly, Hedi of Te Amo from Tapuiki Iwi Authority, and Mokoida Te Amo sitting across from me from Te Kapua Waikaha. I'm pretty close to renaming this group uh, Team Teamo, but we'll get there. <laughs> <laughs> um, very happy that Tapuiki Area Authority has offered to provide some comm support. So this is the work around um, sharing what we're doing with our respective uh, iwi, as well as you know building this interest and awareness of the work that we're doing, so that we're uh, eventually building a larger team. Um, also happy to have more kaimahi on board from each of our many of our iwi. As a lot of familiar names, O'Callaghan, Flavel, Tibbles, and also very privileged to have on board a few of our working group advisors. So Dr. Kura Paul Burke, who had, does a lot of work around research, Matoda Namari, and Akami Wilson from Department of Conservation. So just an absolute start team, to say the least. And finally, in terms of what we're doing next, so, um, so it's the continuation over the next probably year. Um, of learning from our, our koike, learning from our, the people who are on the ground, fishermen, our tuna fishermen, just to understand, you know, how things used to be, what, the, what kind of things they look at before they go um, out fishing, as well as developing the monitoring plan, um, which I'll, I'll um, hand over to Hemi shortly. So 
One of the reasons why I'm absolutely privileged that Kimi is part of our group is he, he has whakapapa links to multiple iwi, so waipaha, um, tapuika, ngāti whakaui. Um, he works for ngāti whakaui ki makitu in environmental education and the other thing is a maramataka um, practitioner. So absolutely um, stoked that he's on board to help to guide us with doing this, developing the monitoring plan and the habitat restoration plans, but doing it a different way than I guess how we've always done stuff. So I'll hand over to Henry to introduce himself. It's really quite a privilege to be here and to be involved with this work. We, um, we've been uh, beginning and looking at the foundation of it over the last few months and been conducting a series of different reconnaissance so that we can um, look at particular places and the, the ultimate aim is to look at sites that are personally significant but also really important and appropriate for us to uh, look at restoration, to look at enhancement and to look at the health and well-being of the hour. Um, uh, long time that we we also did some have done some exploration and bring this off to how we might structure it. And one of the key points that we've looked at is to lay our research and to lay down our plan on the Maramataka. Uh, um, with a, that in mind, we look to begin the program through uh, from Matariki coming up soon and to do an analysis through the Maramataka for the consequent year. Along with that, um, lining up not just the research, but also the management and programming to be in natural cycles with the, the tuna, with the kauga, uh, with the inanga, and we're also focusing in on watercress and kākahi, the freshwater mussels but to make it a much more natural management program and also to build that involvement with our partner. Right. We uh, you look to, and there already has been the foundation or the bones of a freshwater management plan that was constructed alongside um, the Department of Conservation, I believe, and Land Care and so on. And that structure looks at three different focus points and those focus points are to do with the um, wai ora, whenua ora and tangata ora. In other ways it's been phrased with that same framework to do with taia ora, although it reflects sort of that within the same, um, within those focus points. And from them comes some real definition in terms of what we'd like to look at through our lens in terms of the environment that each of those species are sitting in. So the tuna, the kauda, uh, and ino in particular in the lower reaches. So we've done some exploration and looked at places that would be really suitable for um, enhancement. And we've also looked at ideas about what are the wider pictures of the whole eco-based management in terms of looking after this freshwater um, fish. So, with those things in mind, um, and looking at, in particular, the impacts that uh, have impacted on our fishery and so on, and on those different tributaries that lead into the Kaituna, in that particular zone, we met uh, with Tapuika and Waitaha, and have set to look through how we might um, collaborate, and how we might involve our kainga, our, our whānau, in the uh, entire process and um, in addition to which we also looked at what sites, specific sites might be really um, what could take priority in terms of rolling them out over the next year and for us to do a closer analysis and we have one in particular that is sitting there waiting for us and we're talking about the Parapenua Mea 
uh, Street. And it involves, um, well, at least two of our hapu within Tapuika, but we have a wider base than that. We're all connected. But it, um, it also involves uh, a much larger picture than a simple stream restoration. There's wetlands that run through it. There are things to do with hydrology and the dive diversions in order to uh, divert drains that have run off from the flow and so on. So we've started to identify specific spots. We've got another four in mind, but um, the point of us running through that analysis through the Maramataka is to personally connect it to those natural cycles and to our natural way of thinking. And also um, important times within those things, within those cycles that could lend itself towards the surveying, the monitoring and the management program. So what I'm talking about are things like within the marama and within the cycle itself, there are particular days that have high activity, which uh, um, could lend itself to better days to do the research and more success, but it's all to be trialled. Along uh, with that, <coughs> We have discussed some ideas around how we might lay out the management plan so that it really brings in the farmer. We, we've talked about um, documenting and education within our program to, uh, from the outset and involvement with, uh, well, for that particular um, waterway it includes the schools and uh, whānau around that area of Waitangi and Tamatai. We have, with our star team that um, Albert's been talking on, we have um, all of us can call it Māori, and it brought in some other of those impacts that are cultural as well as um, environmental and our connections with the environment and our ability to be able to conduct that within our realm. And um, of course, there are the portions of that that they tend to stem into, or rather delve into other areas of concern. Um, those things that were highlighted to do with climate change and the impact on our freshwater systems and the impact on our people to do with climate change and our connections. And um, we've been doing some exploration, uh, yeah, those kind of impacts and ways that we can look to mitigate the impact on not just ourselves, but also on our fisheries. And that uh, lends itself towards um, our big focus, which is to do with our mahi kai and our traditional mahi kai and restoring those mahi kai and those practices and all of the tikana surrounding. Um, in terms of uh, support, you know, to to and uh, with that, there are two names that we've got up there that we have come in and been physically and vocally supportive. Uh, one is Rapuni Wilson, who works for the Department of Conservation, and he's been hugely involved with Tapuika environmental for a number of years. So um, really valuable and really valuable in terms of uh, specific sighting. We, we visited the Parafenu and we talked specifically around what could be done towards restoration and enhancement. And the second one is um, Dr. Kura Paul Berg, and she's an associate professor at the University of Waikato. We do lots of different work, and Dr. Kura does lots of work in all sorts of different marine spaces. But she has not only come on as an advisor, but has also offered her Māori doctorate team as a support group to come and assist us with um, on the ground. So, Namahi Nuni Kiaranate. And they have uh, they have another star team in the bunch um, who are all marine scientists and uh, strong with strong focus on Matauranga. The uh, Matauranga can't be underestimated in terms of what we're putting together, which is why we looked at a year long um, growth in terms of creating a management plan because their Mātauranga lends itself into the deeper aspects of who we are and our identity. And, you know, it really is our belief that strengthening our identity through the generations strengthens our kaitiakitanga. 
the desire to want to go and do these things and to look after for the and so on. So um, uh, all of these things tend to lend itself to all of the reasons why the money will pay to the, the come together. So you uh, know where that's where we're at at the moment. We've got our team together. We're looking at conducting um, a uh, well lunar monthly um, reconnaissance and analysis, so a general analysis through the criteria and the tributaries that come into it. And we'll conduct that um, uh, twice a month, actually. So we'll conduct that on those different dates that we we're talking about in terms of the lunar cycles. And alongside of that, in the ground, in terms of looking at what we do to enhance and restore um, waterways, as well as the stream, uh, sorry, as well as the surrounding land. And for us to, and also a reminder to ourselves that we look at whole systems. So we're not disregarding when we're talking about Tuna, Koga, and Inanga in the lower reaches. We're also looking to um, engage in and establish a monitoring program for our area, uh, for our hapu in the upper reaches as well. And we can't call it. Any, any questions from members uh, for Albert, Albert or Jimmy? Okay. Yeah, I, uh, oh. I have, uh, first of all, I'm the acknowledge your, your approach to it. And that's equal to collaborating with modern science, our worldview and modern science collaborating together, but it's to get the mix right. And uh, your view on the Matariki is, is highly important, uh, uh, the Marmataka. And uh, of course, the pathways and travel ways of fishes is equal. And of course, but there are other issues that I think that should be added to your planning. And I'll just put it in a metaphorical way that uh, bricks and mortar versus fauna and water. In other words, sometimes the modern technology is driven by economics and they put the, their bricks and mortar in the wrong place. And of course, it has an effect on me. The second part of the question I want to ask you, if you considered things like hydroponics in terms of your riparian pathway, because uh, those would have an effect on your economics as well as the other quadruple bottom lines the social, cultural, and environmental, cultural. and farmers, even farmers may be able to, to go back to the number eight wire, like how they used to, yeah. instead of complaining about things politically, they would be able to consider that once, once upon a time, they invented the number eight wire and it became global. Uh, so we're, uh, so I'm just, just just ask the question is that uh, your framework the uh the uh, that concept of uh, the quadruple bottom line social cultural environmental as well as economics but economics has to take into account the social cultural environmental impacts that type of framework in your main document yeah. Thank you, Maru, uh, Grant. And then, uh, and then, um, to come back. Mati Moana. Uh, thanks for your presentation. Um, look, my question is, I, I, it's interesting you're focusing on the Parafinua Mia stream. Um, I understand totally why that is, because the two happy, I'd say. Um, I'm just wondering, what, in terms of the upper regions versus the lower regions, what does, Sort of the, the spread of the species up and down the stream, but, you know, where what do you find where sort of thing? And secondly, does the does the old council landfill are you going to look into any effects that might be? Um, yeah. 
in, in terms of the, the Parapino Amir is, um, is one of half a dozen options and it's a beginning place for us. And just to go back to that initial part of it, the, um, I, I suppose one of the impetus was the nature of the Parapino Amir, how it's been so straightened and drained and so on. But also it's important for us culturally and as a um, as an iwi, and uh, its site of significance, it sort of lent itself and has lent itself to being one of the first priorities, but definitely not the only one. Uh, in terms of our knowledge and that information to do with the upper reaches and how uh, what is up there and how many are up there, so on densities and, and species, we'd like to find out too, which is kind of the reason why we. <coughs> Um, instigating this plan as well. There is some information, but uh, we have a, a much more intensive idea about getting able to collect that information. So we can get a really clear picture about the state of the environment, the state of each of those streams, the tributaries, and it will help us gauge whether or not what we are looking to do is successful or not down the track. So we can compare it to a baseline, I suppose. Which, has, which also um, really describes that year-long monitoring and analysis through the Maramataka. It gives us a complete cycle baseline for us to be able to compare to with um, an ongoing. We really are looking at a, an ongoing program so that we can generation, generationally um, continue. In terms of the landfill, we haven't talked too much around that yet. But, um, but that's the reason that we wanted it, so we can actually get, have a clear picture about what impacts are uh, impacting on the fresh waterways and the species, then those tama, and then what we might be able to do to, to mitigate them. Sorry. All right. Uh, me mihi ana ki a korua uh, Alvaro o Kohimi me me koto hoki te tima rope uh, totoko mo o koto fakatura me ki amato. Uh, thanks for the presentation. I mean, just my question really relates to um, the wider in, environment um, in, in research that's going on in this space. Are you are you connecting to the other research programs that uh, might have uh, some relevance in some of the studies that you're doing? I'm referencing, of course. You know, efforts in the Waihi history, the Kaikokupu, um, and there seems to be some this close proximity and interrelationships there. Um, so, are you making connections or having conversations in that space as well, Alva, uh, Hemi? Um, kia ora tataru. Um, not at the moment. I guess our focus is just establishing our um, our foundation, and I think over the coming months and over the coming year, we will be connecting in with the, those who are already doing work, like the Kaikokupu. Um, and, and the research that's happening in the Wayne history. So it's it's on the list of to-do, the to-do list. Yeah, no, that's great because I think there's valuable sharing that can be um, created and obviously create efficiencies and exchange of knowledge that would be very useful in all research parts of that particular region. Yeah, kia ora. Uh, much Moana. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, kia ora korua. Thank you for the excellent uh, report, um, Hemi and Alva. Um, I really haven't got a question at, at this point. Um, I, I, just to give you a heads up though, I will have a lot of questions uh, when you come back the next time. I acknowledge that you are setting up and still laying the foundation for the application of Mātauranga Māori um, in the processes that we've been going, uh, going down and so, you know, congratulations for getting this far. We've been waiting for it. You've arrived and thank you for it. Uh, so I'm actually looking for the next part. Um, hear me, what you talk about, the continuing use of Mato, uh, the Maramataka, the analysis that you're gaining for that. What I'd like to see, if you're ready the next time you come back, is actually the deep dive and the detail of that's applied to the priority projects that you're um, that you're identifying, so that we actually see it in motion and its application um, alongside uh, what's being used in Western Science. So, uh, just a mihi to you both, and looking forward uh, 
to the next report that comes in and perhaps send some of that deep dive stuff that I know that you've already started to do. Um, no reira, ngā mihi ki a kōrua. Uh, I, I just have a few things that I want to add, if there's anyone else. Do you have any other comments? Sorry? It's Jane. Oh, sorry, Jane. Jane, hand it over to you. Yeah. Sorry, you, your hand is uh, uh, on your screen is uh, kind of disguised. It's got some background stuff there. Oh, okay. Okay. Sorry. I'll have to change the colour. Um, yes, yeah, so I just um, referencing the report that we're going to be discussing later in the agenda on um, items on the action plan. I was just looking at um, Project 9, which is this project, and it, it um, notes continued delays in financing the contract with TY Māori. This is delayed project related recruitment, progress, and payment. Is, is it, there any updates? Is that no longer relevant? Now that we've received this presentation from you, or are we still working on the contract? Oh, kia ora, Jane. Oh, I could talk for hours about those delays. But in short, um, it, it has been resolved. Um, so the backstory for that one, um, there have been a lot of delays with our funder, TY Māori. Um, they had some changes in personnel and contracts that were supposed to be signed didn't get signed. Anyway, that has all been resolved. Um, and so therefore, uh, invoicing can now occur. <laughs> If, if I can, on the back of what uh, you, your question, Jane, <coughs> before we go to Jeff, um, I just want to remind everyone, <coughs> sorry, that TMARC, uh, the members here, uh, we, we are the sponsors of this particular project, and so, so collectively, it's our project, and, uh, and um, Albert and Hemi are driving that. And uh, later on, uh, we will introduce um, our secretariat, uh, Jane, but she is also providing support into that program. But I just wanted to remind everyone we, we have a collective responsibility in that sense. And, and why I'm mentioning that is because I need to drive to the next part, which is we have a budget. One who has a budget, and uh, we, we haven't used our budget since uh, it came across in the um, settlement. So. Uh, because we've been very uh, astute in how we use it, and, and I suppose that we've been utilising a lot of other budgets that are available. But um, I suppose as members, what I'm asking is uh, we do have money there, and uh, if we need to uh, utilise any of that uh, money within our budget uh, to help resource um, or make purchases that will for resources that will help this project then that's pretty much what I'm putting to our committee, to our, our members, uh, that, that we be supported financially as well. We are coming to the end of the financial year and we still haven't spent anything. So the our budget's there and I'm happy to work with staff around where that money might come out of those budgets, but I'm looking for, I suppose, a bit of a motion or an agreement uh, from the members uh, whether we can pursue that. So, so I suppose I'll put it in, can we do that, members? If I work with staff, I suppose the resolution or the recommendation is that uh, through through myself and maybe Pim, Pim, happy, happy to help, uh, that uh, we will work with uh, Alva and James and uh, Jane, the secretary, and work out what in the budget's existing and what resources they may need in regards to uh, helping this project move forward. Okay, but do I, I don't know if I need to pass that as a motion and ask for a thing or a raise of hands maybe. Can I have some advice? Okay, okay so, so we'll do that work and then come back. Uh, is everyone easy if we do that via email? So, so once we have a conversation with Alva and uh, Hemi and Jane around what the budget amount is, uh, then um, we'll, we'll put that together and then come back. Can I come back by email for, to speed things through in regards to the process and then get a um, an okay, I suppose. Is everyone comfortable with that approach? Okay. I'm a bit cautious. 
because I think that if you had a shopping list of the uh, the games that are going to be run by the Department of Conservation, the Justice Department, the Education Department, then they should put the bill. And uh, the regional economy, things like that. So those who gain from those, those should be billed for it, as opposed to uh, Bit of a pity picture, but I bet on race horses and I know how to uh, <laughs> could have bet each way. Mm. Yeah. Well, I, I think that would definitely be considered if there's funding elsewhere. I suppose I'm asking the committee that we have budget and if we can. Put it on race horse. <laughs> approve, approve it for. Are we moving on? Oh, yeah, okay. We just, we, we're just talking about logistics around when budgets will be approved, etc. So, in principle, we'll move forward on, on, on that, and I'll work on behalf of the board with um, the Kakai group. Um, sorry, uh, Jeff, Kaguri Tabako Kiawe, your turn, sorry. <laughs> Uh, um, the first thing I want to say is I'm, Alva, I'm just so wrapped to hear that you fellas have got this group up and running and, uh, and the mahi is being done and uh, uh, and Hidia, I see your names there, fantastic. So, um, and I can recall, I think five or six years ago, Alva, you brought this to us and and finally, it's become a reality. So um, the rest is uh, in the detail, but uh, it's, a, it's a great start. Uh, don't forget the Paki Paki and others though, eh? Um, and the only thing I want to mention is that we have seven hectares of available land on the edge of the Kaituna at the beginning of the wetland. Don't forget that. It belongs to Tapuika and it belongs to Fakowe, Kimakatu. And that would make a wonderful area for a research station Pim knows what I'm talking about. There are so many things we could do and turn that into to, um, to research our kaimoana and many other things. Uh, a great place for learning. Um, so for me, fantastic. Hey, kia ka. Don't let anything stop you getting to the end of the result. Kia ora. Kia ora, Jeff. Um, probably just one last comment on with you, Rawiti, and uh, I suppose Madam, uh, in, in the makeup of the team, um, I was just wondering whether there was anyone from Ngāti Whakaui Kimakatū or Ngāti Pikiao that you may have in mind who may want to be part of the um, team. And, and if you do, I suppose, make direct contact with uh, Hemi or, or um, the elder. Yeah. 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 I, uh, I quite agree with you. Uh, you need that external inclusion into the comprehensive plan. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you. You're welcome to stay on and get this lesson, whatever you want to do. Uh, so, um, just moving into uh, Google updates. Uh, so, so I've got a, a verbal update to do, but I, I do want to then, like, I'll hold it to the audience, so I'll hand it around and see if there's any updates from everyone. But I'll, I'll make a start. Um, first of all, I uh, just want to welcome Jane Baldwin, uh, who's present with us today. Uh, she uh, to the newly formed position of Secretariat for Tamaru Kaitana and also the Rangi Taiki River Forum. Uh, so um, Jane's been with us maybe a month, maybe. And uh, within that month, uh, I've, I've found Jane's support really essential for, for part of the money that I'm doing in regards to communications and those sorts of things. And I just want to kind of highlight a few things. And now I'm going to just hand it over to Jane to talk about herself. So some of the things that um, Jane has immediately kind of jumped in is supporting the Hataka Kai project. Uh, but, uh, the Kaituna Community Connection in regards to that um, objective uh, is in looking at developing a, a website. So you'll know Tamaru had its own website, 
then the provider of that then uh, left. And so um, the regional council has been carrying that, that uh, website. So but, um, we're in the process of looking for a new developer to develop that website. And I think that that will then become a, a, a tool that we can use in regards to maybe some of the outcomes that come from the Pataka Kai project, et cetera, and other projects as well. Uh, and uh, just another thing, uh, Kaitunga Cultural and Heritage um, thing, so that's a desktop study, and so we're just working with um, uh, Jane around how we might be able to initiate and start that project along. That's the historic history of the catchment that we're working with and how we collect that, how we uh, maybe do a bit of research on that. So I just want to end that one there, and then I'm just going to hand over to Jane to really introduce herself and then... Um, then back to me, I suppose. Yeah. I'm from Ngātiawa and Tufarepo. I have a background with Regional Council. I worked at Regional Council for about 13 years. Uh, multiple areas, mainly in Māori policy. Um, so I have an RMA background, which is hopefully going to be helpful for Te Māori. Um, uh, as part of the Secretariat, I'll also be looking after the Rangatahi River Forum, which is very close to my heart, and I was actually involved in the initial setup of that forum, um, and a, a small part, actually, the setup of this forum also. So, yeah, that's pretty much it. Thank you, Jane. Uh, just going on with my verbal update. Uh, so um, I just want to mention that uh, the second FCO consent pre-hearing meeting uh, will be held on the 24th of May. So in my last meeting, uh, I uh, announced, I suppose, that we went along to a pre-hearing. Uh, there is a second one coming up on the 24th of May. Uh, and uh, so, so probably hear that if you're available and you want to come and have a listen, come along and have a listen to that. Um, we also have the uh, regional policy statement, the RPS uh, change five, which is quite So, those hearings, uh, the date's been set for the 11th and the 13th of October this year, 2022, uh, and noted in this in the essential water, um, fresh water item. Uh, so that's in, in a report later on today from Joe that Joe will be um, talking to. Um, just another couple of things. Um, uh, let me see, which is first. Okay, I just, just want to uh, briefly talk about um, last week, uh, New Zealand Land Care Trust facilitated an online discussion for the North Island. And that was um, based on Takafanaunga many full uh, catchment partnerships and uh, Māori led catchment groups uh, around the work, and that that how the country is working with catchment groups. Uh, so uh, I was asked to attend as panelists on that and speaker. So I spoke on what the work that we do we're doing with um, Tamaru, um, and it was really just an insight into those groups on how to make that connection with one of the Venua and how to, I suppose, bring in the values that we have in regards to environment and working with existing groups. So apparently that uh, went really well. So I just wanted to um, bring that up. Also, um, uh, on the 26th of this month uh, at 11 o'clock, there's the Dairy New Zealand and Bioplenty Regional Council Wetlands Field Day. And that's at, uh, that's Makatu, eh? Yeah, Makatu. And that's the Tiarua Farms. And so uh, it's an open, it's open to anyone to attend just to have a look at uh, how, how that's being managed. I think um, Tim will be talking about it later on, possibly, in his report. Just wanted to mention that. Um, also, um, Uh, te Kitu Motariki in Tupuki. So, so as a celebration for the Motariki in Tupuki, um, they have a two-day uh, Thursday, the 23rd of June and the 24th of June. Uh, and that, uh, the Thursday, the 23rd, is an education. So 
um, I'll be talking to uh, staff to help us uh, put up a tent to promote, well, to promote, but to share and communicate the, the work that we're doing in Tamaru, uh, and also promote the uh, Kakai with uh, our, our schools in the first instance on the Thursday, then on the Friday, the wider community. So it's, a, uh, it's an open invitation, and that will be in the main centre at uh, Tupuke, and it's uh, Te Kito Matariki. Uh, if you are attending on the Friday, uh, then Adi Jar is the afternoon band. So, yeah, to turn up and uh, enjoy. Um, yeah, that's about me for now. Um, I'd just like to hand around now and any members that would like to do a bit of an update on uh, anything really that you're involved with that, that pertains to our co partner. Nick, thank you. Can you give us an update on the Rotorua um, Skyline project? Uh, Zipline. Zipline. Zipline, yeah, sorry. sorry. Yeah, morning, um, So I suppose the it, it sits under the umbrella of Te Mauri Okiri Awa Charitable Trust, which is um, partnership, with, which is working with local mana whenua around the restoration of the land bordering the Okiro Kaituna River and the long term aim of turning, I suppose, the three hectares into 12 hectares of reserve. And um, so, the projects so far, we've, we've gained some good funding and have put in about 750 uh, metres of, um, of stock fencing, removed 160 feral goats, started trapping. Um, probably in about the next two months, we'll have uh, 10,000 plants in the ground with the aim of the next um, five, five years, getting about 60 plants in the ground. Um, this, is, um, this, is, this is set alongside some of the uh, tourism groups that work in the area who want to give back to the space that they're working. And as iwi are partners in the um, zip line, um, they've been amazing and set aside marginal farmland to support this project. Um, had, the, uh, had the official opening of the zip line the other day, which went super well. We had the Mayor Stevie Chadwick there. She jumped on the zip line and had a had a good hoop down the line. So that was really cool. Um, but the feedback we're getting and and from locals as well has been, and particularly um, local iwi who are starting to have come down and have checked out what we're doing and seeing the the incredible change from what was marginal farmland now starting to really plant and and removal of these pest pest species and starting to see growth back in the native trees, starting to see a few more bird light and those sort of things coming back. So super stoked because it's it's this idea that Orkiri is trying to create a sustainable environment where there's a lot of opportunity for work for local people to work on their rivers, telling their stories. And that partnership with Iwi has been amazing. So um, super, super positive project ongoing um, and we're just continually trying to grow it. And I suppose the extension is to everybody out there, if you want to come and have a look at it, um, would be love to take you around and, and get you either on the zip line or we can full drive you over and have a look at the farm side of things to uh, see what's going on. So um, we're in our second week, nice and busy. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's been a really great project. Thanks, Nick. Uh, just a reminder to board members, uh, it may have been 2000 and 2017, 2019 maybe. Sam Sutton came and did a presentation to us around a zip line on the top end of the Kaitana, around Orkere. Uh, so it's a, it's a great advantage, I suppose, uh, for, for, for that to be able to be progressed in partnership with local iwi and hapu of that uh, part of the river. So congratulations. Uh, Nick, pass on congratulations to Sam. We'll, we'll, we'll do this. Cheers. We'll do Yeah. Uh, Tito? Yeah, kia ora, Dean. Look, just a couple of updates and a couple of things that I'm involved in. Uh, one of them, Keyside, um, you know, you can you note now that following the signing of the MOU with Tapuika, that um, it's really rolling ahead. Uh, if you go onto the expressway, you can see the developments fast proceeding. And uh, I believe the relationship with Tapuika is emerging as pretty solid. I mean, there will be moments of speed bumps here and there, but at the moment, it looks, it, sound, it feels pretty good. And I see Jeff there for Nati Marukukere as well. Uh, Witere has been very much part of it as the chair of Tapuika. Um, and in the context of, so so I guess uh, the idea, the, the thought is to 
just to keep close to what's happening there because they tuna and I know that um, Keyside Scott Hamilton did a presentation to uh, to to this group and um, so my message is just keep aware, keep close, keep in contact and uh, and keep knowledgeable about where everything's are uh, have developed to for the for the um, Rangiuru uh, uh, Industrial Park. Um, also uh, talking about Matariki, uh, Keyside were uh, approached to sponsor for next year's Matariki, but I believe in a conversation I've just had with Scott that they will be a, a support sponsor for the Matariki celebrations this year. Um, so that's encouraging and that all comes on the back of the relationship with Tapuika as well. So um, so that's to me is, is good news and a good way to support um, our partners in that space. Uh, bridging over to the Waihi Estuary, the Kaikokupu, um, uh, we today has been involved as a Tapuika chair in a group of iwi um, collective, which includes Māke no Whaka Hemo, uh, Ngāti Pikiao, Ngāti Whakaue and, uh, and, and uh, Tapuika in the restoration of the estuary. Um, and the, in, in particular, some of the funding that's been available for the, through the Ministry of uh, Environment. They've come together pretty strongly, um, you know, representing Ngāti Mākino was, is the chair, um, uh, Lawrence Tamati, and was Muruwai Ihakara as well until his sad uh, passing not so long ago. Uh, before we pass in the last workshop with this particular group to work on strategies and frameworks for, for the history um, restoration, uh, he made the comment that let the, the, let the, the, the cleanup of our history be a metaphor for the well-being of our people. Uh, that has been attributed to Muruwai um, in, in the vision statement that has come out of that particular group. So. It's a good tribute to Muruwai and a constant reminder now that our common goal is to clean up that estuary. And given its proximity to the Kaituna and obviously the, the tribes involved in that space, the Iwi involved in that space, again, it's a good connect for, for Te Maru Kaituna to remain aware of what's happening in that space as well. Because I think holistically, while the Kaituna is where we focus, holistically, we're all included in the context of the ecosystems and the environment around that space. And it's good to know for what, what's taking place in that area. But also, um, Tawa, which is the Tiaratawa Primary Sector Group, have an our land and water research program running uh, in that particular area on a case study farm at Otamarako. Again, the whole thing is to look at decision tools, well-being decision tools that might aid in the decision and use of our lands, which ultimately impacts on the water and the flows of tributaries and estuaries and so on and so forth. So a lot happening. And I suppose the message to me as a alluded to in the first question that I asked today was about keeping a handle on what's going on, looking for places where we can avoid duplication, where we can have cohesive effort and actually maximize our endeavors and whatever whatever environmental issues we're working on in this particular area. So just a very quick summary, um, Dean, of some of the happenings and going on in this particular area. Thank you. Any members sitting? I, the overall view I see that is how important the Māori economy is and uh, looking after that economy, uh, since particularly the treaty claims. Uh, broadly speaking, I'm saying that uh, that uh, the port of Tauranga is Rome and all roads lead to Rome. Those roads leading to Rome are the eastern Arturian and how that's taken care of. The eastern arterial leads to um, the C and I plains, treaty plains. It's only all the forest in the central North Island. We now own all that. All those logs on the wharf belongs to um, the, those who, who took the case to the Waitangi Tribunal. And so that's part of the regional economy. And then there's the waters, waterways. And that's big holes is uh, attached to many of the, um, the lakes. And I would say in a broad sense that uh, all those lakes and, and those waters are the, uh, the lungs of uh, the fish that Maui caught. And, uh, and they're, they're highly important to the regional economy as well as the national economy. That's the economics of it. But how do we look after the other parts? I see that if we congest it, put the import of Tauranga into congestion, then uh, we probably may need the Rangiuru Park to to go what it originally was designed for, a regional, a uh, industrial park. And so there, there needs to be a land port somewhere. 
some way along on the way to take the congestion off the port. And that's, that would be responsible in terms of the roads to road. And, uh, so there's a lot of those innovations. We haven't got the innovation innovators at the moment to think of those things that would uh, collaborate the quadruple bottom line, the social, cultural, environmental, and economics. But economics has always taken into account the other three bottom lines. I just want to make that broad, uh, that broad statement to say that we need to think things in the bigger picture than what it is. The regional parks were set up in a, in a way that it protects the aquifers, that act brings out the water to the to the water supplies, the Waiari and all that sort of thing. We have to take all those into account, looking after the drains, the springs, the riparians, and those those sort of planning that we should be doing and talking about now. That's I wanted to make that big was in response to Tony's uh, overview. Uh, uh, thank you, Manu. Uh, I, I might just add a strain into that too. Um, so, um, if we're talking about old terminology for the Finuan and how it uh, works, uh, Tapuia had a, a name for the wetland area we call them wetlands now, uh, the Atiwatika. The so so uh, um, Manu spoke about the the uh, the uh, liver, did you? Lungs. The lungs. Uh, so the Atiwatika is the kidney, and so the, the large area of wetland that used to be there is the kidney or the filter for the fish. When we talk about the fish, we're talking about Tika Māori, the North Island, that's the fish. And so if you can visualise it from above and, and look at, at the North Island as a fish, then you'll see where the ate uh, uh, or the liver, comes, uh, the kidney in that comes out of the fish. So uh, it's important uh, otherwise, our country will be on dialysis, and so it's so, so it's important that the work that we do around wetland and um, creation is an important part, not only for our region but for the survival of the fish. They like anyway. But I uh, just would like to um, acknowledge John. John has come into our meeting. John and um, Grant, any any update from you guys, or is that an report something? Right. Yeah, okay. Um, basically, uh, Council has progressed extremely well with our Mariah Wastewater project. I know we give a bit of an update on this every time we come in, and um, the CIP funding that we rec Council received to, to do this, um, the the Work has to be completed by the 30th of June, officially. Um, I, at our recent Te Ehu or Te Waka or Te Arawa um, meeting in Tupuki, um, it was a bit disturbing to learn that Haraki Marai and Tawa Kapito hadn't been um, able to progress any um, reticulation or offset upgrades. So. I'm just wondering if if um, the, there is any way that that could possibly be still considered. Um, and um, I, I did speak to Calvin Hill, who's our former water engineer at Western Bay, um, the other, on Wednesday at the Waiari uh, um, Kaitiaki Advisory Group, and um, asked him his thoughts. He said, oh, it's never too late. So. So I would recommend to the Hapu or the Marae committees that they consider what's possible still. Um, and I did talk to Darlene about um, trying to arrange some meetings with our water staff to see if something can be done before it's too late. Um, to book him up to Ward, Reserve Management Plan, uh, all the consultation is complete and we're due to, it's due to be adopted by Council on the 14th of June. Um, and I see there's a um, Waka launching um, project in Tamaru, which has been acknowledged by the Tapuki Market to Reserve Management Plan. Um, I'd just like to introduce another item 
as, as a representative on Tapuki Community Board, we've got this project going called History and Cultural Heritage Signs Project. So we're trying to establish some uh, some new signage around Tapuki. Uh, the community board's um, prepared to put in funding to uh, for up to seven signs initially, and it could be an ongoing project, which will be part of a heritage trail. And uh, we've been working with uh, well, I've had meetings with um, Wataha Iwi and Tapuweka Iwi through the Chairman Wetari and um, through Te Kapu or Wataha through Mokoweta and Vivian and um, also Kahui, uh, um, Kahui Aku or Tapuki, Bikihini and uh, Tatoi Takuere Kira. And um, so we, we we are looking at incorporating Maori history on, on these signs alongside European history. And um, it seems to be a good opportunity to um, and, 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 um, uh, display some of the Kotuna, Waiari, um, Awa history um, on, on some of these signs, even the Monga, significant Monga. So, so that's a work in progress, uh, but we do hope to have something on the ground before the end of this triennium, which is coming up pretty quick. <laughs> so any help from uh, maybe you, Dean, would be really helpful in terms of stories or, or items that might be included. Um, just one last thing. Uh, I'm also involved in a group called Te Ara Kahikati Pathway Society, established a little walkway, but we're also looking at other connections within Tapuki uh, and a spin-off of our incorporated society as a new a charitable trust called Tapuki Trails Trust, and, and they are actually the chairman of it. I think is James Trevelyan, and, and they're looking at um, fundraising to assist with further development of trails and, and you know the Kaituna Cycleway Walkway project in Tamaru um, may well be some some um, cross pollination 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 within that project. So that's about it from me. Thanks. Uh, Jeff. Oh, thank you, Dean. I, look, I, I, I thought I'd, I might make mention um, uh, Otukawa Farm, which is a Frankenstein of Ahu Whenua Trusts, um, just on the, the northern side of Far Road, and it does uh, border the Kaituna and parts. Um, about eight kilometres of drainage, I think, is what we've got that covers the, the whole of that farming area. And uh, we've begun a fairly extensive riparian project along there, refencing, replanting, uh, with the whole idea of improving our waterways and making things better. Uh, so I thought if that's if that's something to talk about. Um, uh, and the other thing is, um, um, Maru, I said you heard you say there was no innovation uh, amongst our lot. I don't agree with that. I think there's plenty of innovation. Um, our, lots of our people have been innovating for. For years, mate, it's it's getting people to listen, and understand, and uh, and uh, find ways to remove the fear. That that's where I see the um, the opposition coming from. But it's getting better. Um, but I, I agree with the rest of your co papa. Okay, to buy. Thank you, Dean. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, it was good to have um, Otuko on the radar because it's right in the in the centre point of uh, the area we're talking about down the lower catchment. Okay, uh, I'm going to take. Oh, no, sorry, Jane, is your hand raised as a... Yes, it is. I change colour. I don't know whether it's any better. But um, anyway, I just wanted to note that the uh, Regional Council's Environmental Enhancement Fund is open for applications. There's 300,000 um, available um, in the upcoming year. So if there are any groups that would like to put in an application, we'd really welcome them. Much appreciated. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we, we'll, sorry. We'll, we'll be moving on now to um, agenda uh, item 10, our reports. And um, sorry, I, I'm just looking. Do we need to move the. No, we don't. Okay. Uh, so, agenda item 10, which is the uh, Tomato Kaituna Action Plan status report. Is that you, Bill? Who's going to be talking to this? That, that's me. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, 
great to hear actually about that Tupuki Trails Trust initiative, Councillor Delhi. Is that right? Um, if, I, if we connect with them, we might be able to get Project 15 out of the starting game. It's yeah. currently one of the four sitting there with no action against it. Um, I'll turn my camera on just so that those of you who are at, at home or working from elsewhere can, can see. And um, also acknowledge Jeff that Otukawa Farms Initiative. Um, now that's a, a big environmental program, which is part of the focus catchments project in your action plan. So it's all, all linked up, as is the, um, the wetland day that Chairman Flavel referred to at Tiarawa Farm, which is next Thursday at 11 a.m. Um, if you're interested in that one, I have put a, a link in the Zoom chat. Um, but otherwise, you just have to Google there again, Z, click on events, Bay of Plenty, and you'll see it there next Thursday. Everyone's welcome. And I'll show you a couple of pictures as we go. Um, what I thought I'd do, if it's all right, is just run you through a PowerPoint, um, which highlights a couple of the projects, but not all of them. Um, but feel free to ask me questions about other projects in the status report as we go. So just checking, can everyone see that, um, that PowerPoint on the screen now? Okay, um, oh, I better just jump back to the top of the thing. There we go. Um, yeah, so in summary, um, 10 of your 18 projects are considered by their leading, uh, by their leads to be on track. In the state of screen, six are amber, you know, either there's a funding issue or there's a slippage issue or there's a, you know, not, no one available to do the work or, or what have you. Um, and and um, yeah. There's, there's a couple there that uh, haven't started or that um, uh, and without puts it out of the gate yet. Um, so here's a bit of an overview of a couple of projects. So project one, lowland drains and drainage canal improvement. Um, 1B refers to the Ford Road pump station upgrade. Now, many of you will be familiar with this because it has been a project on the books for a number of years now. Um, What's happening right now is that uh, Kathy Thiebel-Arden from our engineering team has got some recent um, geotechnical work done. Um, and the, the idea is that the consent lodgement will occur quite soon. The council did in its LTP um, provide for the costs of upgrading the Ford Road pump station with the preferred option that was identified through that multi-criteria analysis with, with Becker and a range of um, stakeholders. And that is to place additional capacity adjacent to the existing pump station at the diagonal drain and widen the, the drainage network from Ford Road across to the west um, at, at diagonal drain. And I'll show you what I mean here. So this is just a picture of um, a borehole to obtain a geotechnical sample from the stock bank at roughly the location where the new uh, pump station facility would be added, which is very close to the existing one and quite close to the Lower Coturna Wildlife Management Preserve. This picture shows you the location. So if you see where my mouse is, that's where the existing pump station and the new capacity will be added. And those blue um, dotted with black dotted line zones show you where the existing drainage network is too narrow or not deep enough to convey the water fast enough from the forward road end of the system to the proposed new pump site. So there's some widening work to be done there and replacement of existing crossings for the farmer um, or the farmers actually. So it's um, Eric Chittam and um, Luther Semelink. Uh, farming those properties there. Uh, any questions on, on that one or should I carry on? Have you done a, uh, a search on the three channels that used to flow through the Makatu history? Yes. There was one across the other side, there was one in the middle, there was one close to the right. And of course, uh, the whole problem with the, the, the Pippi beds, the indication where, where the sedimentation or the sands have built up where you can't get pippies in that basically. 
and uh, where that place used to be walked for the last of the years. So the impacts has probably come from the developments that's up the creek, if you like, up further. That's, uh, that's one point. The other point is in terms of that reserve, the Matiku Reserve. That's where the town of Wakanuba built at, uh, at Hope Corner. That's where the, the, the wetlands are. That needs to be taken into account. Chamaho objected to the road being there. And of course, that's also had an impact in terms of uh, what's happened in the the Oahong uh, Apuroiro for the Kaisena history. So, just an answer to your first question, um, through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, aware of those three historic channels in Ongatoro, Makitu history. And um, my understanding is that the reason that the middle one disappeared and, and the one closer to the Mai has almost disappeared is because of the infilling from coastal sediment since 1956 without the river flushing it back out. And uh, we are seeing some signs from monitoring since the commissioning of the re-diversion that the extent of that what we call flood tide delta, that big pillow of sand outside the Marae, that it is starting to um, fritter away at the edges. So it'll take some time though for that process to, you know, it took, it took 20 or, or, or 40 years to, to fill in and it'll take some time to empty back out again. Um, yeah. the, the, the good thing about this, this proposed pump station is that it, um, rather than almost all of the puddle water from that drain coming into the uh, river at a point where it will go straight into the estuary and onto those puppy beds. This proposed location means that um, nearly 80% of it will go out uh, to sea at Titamu and, and not into the estuary because it'll get a chance to mix with the main flow and go out, um, out through the mouth at Titamu. So, so we see that as a, a good thing um, from an environmental perspective. Um, if you look at on your screen now, you'll see the two um, detailed design options that are currently being progressed by the engineers. One is an Archimedes screw, uh, which is that one on the right. So the screw turns and lifts the water up. That has some advantages from a fish uh, perspective because it doesn't um, chop the eels up as much. Um, the one on the left, the axial flow pump, is, is sort of a more traditional approach. Um, uh, but those are the two detailed designs that are currently being looked at by the engineering team. Jumping across to um, the other location, Maru, that you talked about in your kōrero, uh, Whakapo kōrero. So at the bottom end of the Waitapuia stream catchment, which is essentially that catchment between um, Makatu Road and, and um, Wilson's Road and the ridge um, up towards uh, the turn off to Waihi history uh, is, is this location here. So the Whakapo Kōrero wetland, the, the natural part of it, is you can see it in the background here. And just like to acknowledge um, Tauro Management Limited and TELT um, for the work that they, particularly Terry Tapsil, have put in over the last seven years to removing pest plants like pampas and willow, um, recreating um, hydraulic connections to the estuary and the adjacent streams. And um, also, to a certain extent, working with Western Bay Pinty District Council on improved visitor access uh, through and around it. So, if you haven't had a chance to look through Pakapo Kōrero at all in the last few years, go and have a look. You can access it from two points um, along the new cycleway, uh, and it is looking, I think, um, pretty special. What you can see in the foreground here is a constructed treatment wetland that is about 70% or 75%, I think it says here, complete. Um, so our rivers and drainage team have been working with Anna Dawson from the land management team um, to get this over the line. And it's one of three constructed treatment wetlands in the vicinity of Makatu that are either in the process of being built or have recently been completed. And they've been built to the NIWA national guidelines for constructed treatment wetlands, which are relatively new. And the idea is that if you can include somewhere between two and five percent of your catchment area in a treatment wetland near the you know, at the bottom of that area, you can strip out somewhere between 20 and 60 percent of the contaminant loads, particularly nitrogen and phosphorus, but sometimes other things as well. And it relies on a particular hydraulic residence time 
in a particular um, sequence of vegetated and unvegetated areas. So the open water is at the upstream end, um, along with the sediment trap, and then you've got shallower areas with denser vegetation, so you don't get waterfowl accumulating near the bottom end of it. Um, we've got newer monitoring, two of those. One's at the new Bay Gold headquarters at the corner of Money and Tuju Road, and the other is at um, the Hickson property uh, at the corner of uh, Pongkawa School Road and State Highway 2. So if you're driving through either of those areas, you'll see those ones. This one here is harder to see from the road. You have to sort of um, go up towards the motor camp at the top of the hill at like two and crane your neck around to the left or the right, and you might just sneak a peek at it. But if you do want to have a look at it, this is one of the sites that you go to next Thursday at 11 a.m. as part of that um, wetlands field day that a couple of my staff will be at. Um, heading on to project seven, um, you'll see um, in the foreground of this image the Coast Guard and um, commercial fishermen facilities that were constructed as part of the re-diversion on what we call the salinity block. And just to remind you that that bit of grass area here, um, that was built in order to stop salt water from short circuiting um, around into the estuary because there was a particular focus both from an ecological and a cultural perspective on getting fresh water from the river rather than recirculated salt water. Um, Mr. Chairman, I've got a, a video which takes about three minutes, which is a drone flyover starting from the eastern end of Tapahi Kahawai and heading back this way. Do we have time to see that or would you prefer to skip that at the moment? Just um, everyone's okay with that? We'll watch a short one here. Okay. So some of you will know Andy Belcher, who is um, a photographer at Makatu. He's been taking still and video images for us around every three to six months since the construction of the Kotuna Redivision started in June 2018. That's a pretty neat record to have of changes in the environment over that time. If any of you are interested in you know, accessing particular images, you know, whether it's for the Pataka Kai project or anything else, um, just sing out as it um, gives you a good, there's no better um, way of seeing what's changed eh, than, than having a look at this. So we're just approaching the eastern end of Papahi Kahawai here, and you can see um, the, the chenier, that's this thing here, that was 23,000 cubic metres of sand from the Lower Kaituna Wildlife Management Reserve, which resulted in wetlands being created on, on land there. But it also provided for a specific salt marsh restoration opportunity on Papahi Kahawai, rather than all of that low-lying land on the island um, reverting straight to mudflat, which was something that the owners didn't want to see. So there are two breaches in that tenure which allow the fish uh, to, to come and go. And um, I was out there the other day with a couple of staff uh, from Gisborne District Council because they're looking at some similar opportunities to restore salt marsh around a few of their, um, of their rivers. Um, the bridge, uh, some of you would have been there, I think five years ago now, when we took away the causeway that used to block this creek since, was it 1963? Something like that. Um, and it had, what it, what that cause I did was it, it made all of this area in the upper Papahi Kahawai Creek full of macroalgae. It was orange and yellow and brown and it stunk and it had about 600 mils of anoxic mud underneath it. In the last five years, as you can see, a lot of that algae is gone. It's got a sandy bottom through much of it and we've now got two only worms, um, and, and lots of uh, invertebrates making their way back into that habitat where previously there was, there was very little. Um, it's also really well used by birds. Uh, there's a flock of spoonbills, which is up to about 50 odd now. Uh, there are stilts that are there every day. Um, and I think in total, Birds New Zealand through Paul Cumming and Julian Fitter and that, um, the Bowes group, have detected something like 43 different species using the habitats that you can see on this image here. There's a few shags flying away because of the drone coming overhead, probably. Um, 
This area directly in front of the drone now is the last area to be planted. So that only happened last year, this, this patch here. Um, and there has been a little bit of, uh, I guess, debate among the birding fraternity as to whether or not we've planted too much of it. Maybe we should have left some more of it bare sand. Um, but our rationale for planting it was that if we leave bare sand above the spring high tide mark in that area, it just turns to pampas. And um, so better to have indigenous shrubbery rather than, um, than pampas. And you can see how well those plants have taken. Um, some of the pH of the soil in that area was as low as four um, when it was trucked in um, during construction. Across the river there, you can see Ford Island in this area. It's some private land, but um, Jeff and Diane Ford have negotiated an agreement with the regional council where we take care of the pests and weeds and any illegal structures, and they provide access to the public to pass across the, the island and use it for their enjoyment. So that, that agreement is valid for 10 years from 18 months ago, and I'm hopeful that we can renegotiate something at, at the end of that 10-year period. But if you do feel like I'm heading down, going for a walk and exploring, it's, it's a neat place to go. And once you're across the island, you can walk another um, kilometre or so um, along the new channel of the re-diversion to, to the far end. Right, that's probably enough. Thank you. I see um, a comment from Rawali Bana saying tons of parore have returned as well. So that's good news. Yeah, I had heard that, um, Rawali. Which is good. Um, I think we can mull it the day they open the bridge. Yes. Just a, a couple of slides left on the presentation, if we still have a moment or two. Um, this slide is from um, uh, Katie McGinnity, I think, uh, in relation to the Tipuki Te Te Makitu uh, Reserve Management Plan. Um, which is scheduled for adoption by Councillor Daly and Councillor Scrimmager on the 14th of June, 22. Uh, I'm not sure how much um, feedback was obtained from the community here, but um, there's one, one thing that Katie asked me to highlight, and that was, well, it's on, in your report on page, page 45 of the agenda. Um, just in relation to the Bell Road Reserve, um, so pages 45 and 46, um, there is uh, some work going on to investigate the potential for additional reserve facilities such as seating, um, investigate opportunity to provide naming signage at reserve frontage, um, investigate designation of part of road reserve to create reserve and work with um, Tamari Wakaituna River Authority to improve access to the river and implement um, the relevant actions from the action plan. Um, investigate opportunity for site to be used for rocket launching. Um, so it's it's an area that, I, mean, I, I don't know if you've been to the Bell Road boat ramp car park, but it's a very popular place, especially with Papa Moore's population growing the way it is. Um, it's not unusual to, you know, not have a place to park your vehicle there and have to launch and then go around the corner and find a spot alongside the road somewhere. So if you've got any thoughts on the future of that Bell Road Reserve, I'm sure Councillors Daly or Scrimmager would be interested, or you can go straight to Katie McGinnity at um, Western Bay. There is, there was actually a slide. Yeah, just a Couple of updates from our maritime team. So this is not in your action plan. This is just a, a another operations update from the, from the regional council that they've um, been working with locals and landowners to try and improve signage um, around the swimming holes at a few points on the river. And here's an example um, near the railway bridge of a sign um, that's recently been put in. Um, and I, I'm not sure if. Did, were, did, were you involved, Dean, in, in helping with the wording for this, or no? Was it just the locals? It might have been that the, 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 the it would, would have been Jeff's try. Right. Thanks, thanks, Manukukiri, Jeff, um, for for the assistance with these signs. 
Um, just a quick update on the Kaituna Mall. It's pretty much finished. Um, it looks good. Here's a picture of it. Um, we have had some recent correspondence from fishers saying that they want um, rod holders to be reinstated. Uh, but our harbour next master, <laughs> and next <laughs> is, yeah, our harbour master has said he would much prefer rod holders not to be reinstated because that encourages people to leave their rod there and then go and sit in their car and um, have a snooze. And um, and then when a boat tries to get in or out and honks its horn, um, no one's there to reel the line in. And then you get issues between the fishers and the boaties. So at the moment, um, council's position is that we prefer not to reinstate the rod holders. If, if people want to fish, they can hold the rod or ask someone else to look after it briefly while they get off to the boat bucket or whatever they need to do. So if you hear about that debate, that's the story. Put a, put a sign up there. Send it to count the other. Send it to count the And that's the presentation, everybody. If, if you have any questions about any of the status reports, um, <laughs> open to us. Okay, uh, can I move it to uh, accept um, or receive the report? Right, and uh, I'll second that you can have that brings us to, um, oh, I don't think there's any questions for you. Oh. Brings us to uh, 10.2 Central Water Policy Program Update. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Kia ora um, a quick update on the paper, which is on page 54 of your agenda, so it's the Essential Freshwater Policy Program update. So this is a, just a very brief overview report about uh, the freshwater work that we're doing. So uh, very shortly I will introduce uh, Gemma Moleta here to share with us a little demonstration of our online engagement that we've got up and running at the moment for the visions and outcomes. You know, I've got um, uh, James Deere here to give you a demonstration about the WET tool, which is about the water quality and ecological data that we have available for the public. Mm -hmm. So the paper just um, adds a little bit of detail around the um, EMU involvement in the uh, co-papa that we're on with fresh water. Ruben Gardner is um, fronting our Kopapa Māori work stream and he's been encouraging any involvement in the kaituna and the wider, uh, wider motu. Um, he's been working with the chair and he's uh, with general support. Oh, so last time when we talked, um, we were talking about the vision and the outcomes and since then Ruben's been working with uh, Chair Flavel and um, that's using the river document as that basis for the vision and the example. You know, we talked about the example vision. Um, so I think the general support for using the river documents vision as the basis for uh, work going out towards the community. And Gemma will share uh, where we're heading with that with the online engagement. And as, as Chairman Flavel mentioned in his chair's briefing, there's just a mention here that there's the Regional Policy Statement for Change 5, which you'll remember is a really important uh, change to our higher document, which is uh, Timari's change, really, because it's the change that recognises and provides for the, the river document in that Regional Policy Statement. Um, and as Chairman Flavel mentioned, the hearing is coming up, so Timaru have a submission in support of that, and it's on the 11th to the 13th of October. So that might be something that a number of members um, would like to attend. So just sharing that, and it's going to be in the council chambers. Um, and the it's a freshwater hearing panel, and that's been appointed. And the chairman of that is Anton Coffin. And remember, Timaru had made a not uh, recommended nomination to have the EWI nominee there. So Rawali Faulkner is there on that panel, as well as Council and Douglas. 
Um, so if there's no questions about the paper, I would I'll, um, first Gemma Molita and she can share with you our online tool that we hope that tomorrow members might encourage the area to take up and give us some feedback on. Tēnā koutou everyone, uh, ko Gemma Tokoingoa. I work with uh, Joe and the Freshwater Policy Team and Ruben Gardner and the Freshwater Policy Team. Um, I am just going to show you just briefly uh, the online engagement tool that we have up and running now and I encourage everyone to go and provide their feedback on. Um, just to give you a little bit of background, I think um, you were taken through the Participate page last year on values and outcomes. And we had 26 contributions for the Kaituna Freshwater Management Unit. Um, the majority of those were happy, um, but some of the areas of concern were water quality, um, improving, improving it for contact recreation, fishing, um, sometimes the smell or the look of the water. And um, and then some of the positive ones were the beautiful spots like Otani Wainuku, uh, Pataroa Falls and Rapara Pahoi Falls. Um, so this, this site here is, oh yes, you can just see that, um, is for the whole of our region and it asks for your feedback on visions and outcomes. So there's just, oh, and there's a chance to win um, five $200 vouchers. So there's another little incentive to um, put, your, put your comments in. Um, so you can just click on the teardrop of the freshwater management unit that's important to you. Um, and you may want to provide feedback on more than fresh, one freshwater management unit. Um, so you click on this and it comes up with a little description of the Kaituna catchment. And what do you think? Fill in your email address to go in the prize drawer and then select the values that are important to you. So um, some additional questions come up based on what you um, want to provide feedback on. And so if you wanted to talk about um, where you swim, then you could say that you're either happy with the current state or you think it needs improving or it needs to improve significantly. Um, another option is cultural, and we have a lot of different um, information under that or a lot of different values that you might want to talk about. Um, traditional resources, time of species, mahinukai, waitapu, and so you just select um, the ones you want to talk about and then fill in the slider again. Um, there's also the option of um, requesting contact from uh, our Kopapa Māori team for the cultural values side of things. Um, and then there's just a question at the end to say um, whether you're talking about the whole freshwater management unit or the site-specific um, spots that you're providing feedback on. Last three questions are about a vision for um, the Kaituna FMU. Uh, so we, rather than sharing the example vision that was shared with Iwi uh, back in January and discussed in your previous meetings, uh, we kind of left these questions as open as for what improvements people would like to see in the water, what are their goals, um, and when they would like those goals to be reached. And so we've kind of just suggested a 10, 30 or 50 year time frame um, that would obviously be um, worked through when we get an idea of uh, what, what goals we have and how we can achieve them and what the impact on everyone will be from that. Uh, and then what do we need to protect? What are we happy with at the moment um, that's still really important? and then just submit at the end and all that information comes back uh, to us to um, add to our um, current information on the different freshwater management units. So um, 
at this stage, we've used the e management plans, river documents, and these strategies. Um, and the previous participate work and the work that James D is supposed, uh, just about to take you through um, to get a starting point for uh, where, where we're at. Anyone have any questions? Thank you on the uh, method of uh, giving a public submission, if you like, <laughs> by, by way of these, uh, this type of form. This, yeah, this particular, but how serious is this taken when you analyze all these, these papers? So all of this is considered. One thing I would note is that we must be consistent with any um, EWI legislation. So anything that was contrary to that would not be an option. Um, it's all evaluated. So uh, I, I guess one person's opinion versus the opinion of a whole group um, might be given more, would be given more weight, but um, it's just an opportunity for anyone that wants to have their say to have their say. Uh, we also have paper copies for anyone that um, doesn't want to fill it out online, um, and we're pushing it through all our newsletter contacts um, around our Rohi information, Freshwater Flash. Yeah, I, I see this being, um, it's either, you can take it as a legitimate uh, submission or damned if I do, damned if I don't. Rubbish. <laughs> well, it all has to be considered, is what I'd say. So um, there's, there's the opportunity and we will come up with um, contrasting views within this um, process over the next two years. So um, all of that will have to be evaluated, but it will be considered. So, but just because you posted it doesn't necessarily mean you definitely get it. You know? I think what I would add to um, Gemma's call it all about um, the participating and how seriously it might be taken, um, Maru, is that um, I think uh, the now, people around this table have a good strong position because of your river document. We have to restore, protect, and enhance the awa. And we also have the very strong reading in the National Policy Statement for Freshwater, which um, you might remember the 2020 version, which um, strengthened the uh, Māori values part of it. They strengthened the Mahinga Kai values. They do have to be put into that mix rather strongly. And that's why we're encouraging uh, Iwi and Te Maru to be involved and really heighten uh, the information that we have so that we are in a strong position to uh, really understand what Te Mana or Te Wai means for this part of our rohi because uh, we have to take the, uh, the first priority is to the water, the why. Uh, second for drinking water and things, and then third for your economics, your use of the hour. So I think um, it is a strong position to be in, and um, we just uh, would uh, seek your involvement and your uh, uh, taking this co up back to your iwi so that and sharing with them either the hard copies or the links so that uh, we get that broad knowledge to feed in. Okay. Well, it's still a good idea. Hmm. What I'm saying is, how seriously do you take these, these points? Where it's your legitimate submission. Let's uh, uh Titani, did you have some uh, question? Yeah, no, yeah, just yes, a bit of a comment as well. Um, you know, I'm always conscious of the fact that the headwaters of the Kaituna it starts at Rotorua, comes down to Rotoriti, then down to the Kaituna, and of course there's extensive programs going on to clean up those lakes. Um, and I was once uh, told by um, some scientists that in the TLI, trans, you know, the um, uh, trophic level index is 4.2, then by science definition is clean, 
And our response back to that when our mukapuna get haki hakis because they're swimming in the Oho Channel, yeah. when our inanga are gone and our kauranga are gone, that's our mataranga about clean, clean water. Yeah. So, so looking at these visions around people saying, seeing all of these come back is the, is the, is the change in, in, in life for our freshwater systems. And, and, for, and for us, that's the vision, really. It's quite simple when we can actually regain that opportunity to engage with our kaimuana, with our, with our, 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 our recreational side of things, to swim in those lakes, et cetera. So I'm reminded of that. And I look at that in the context of what's happening upstream and what's happening in the kaikuna. The other thing that actually impacted on me as I watched, and I guess it relates to this, as I watched the, the um, videos or the shots of the uh, makatu catchment, and it, you know, beautiful shots. And I was saying, well, that's really nice, and we're doing all this stuff. And then I look at it, but in the next 30 or so years, when I won't probably reach being a centenarian, uh, that will be quite a different plane. You know, if you look at the sea level rise issues and things like that, and that's only 30 odd years away, potentially, and it could be double the, uh, the rise that people are predicting. So I look at it and I'm going, man, it's going to be quite a different world in 30 years, and that's not long. And um, so I just wonder, I just wonder in the context of seeing this stuff happening and seeing what I would consider to be a relatively short term uh, scenarios emerging, that uh, it could be a whole lot different life looking at that plane in 30 years time. I can just see a whole flood of water. It'll be water we're looking at, not, and not plantations and, and, and platform of Tangora. It'll be something else. So look, mate, I'm sorry, but that was just as reflection as I looked at it, as I look at what we're doing, as I look at the great work we're doing, but the forward planning, that 30 odd years out in 250, 260, what, what, what is the thinking around that at all, if at all, in what we're doing now? Thank you, sir. Um, I, I just, uh, I suppose, have a, have a couple of questions. Definitely, I mean, we can socialise this with our iwi and, uh, and uh, iwi groups, etc., and then see how, um, I see you have a wānanga mentioned in here, the whole of wānanga, we can certainly do that. And uh, I, would, I would possibly also offer um, an opportunity if, uh, with uh, the Matariki, uh, to get to Matariki uh, in Tupuke, that, that you join that and maybe do a bit of a promo on this as well. That we, I mean, you engage not only you, but you engage wider communities. So. Hmm. Anyway, some food for thought, Dandy. Excellent. <clears throat> No further questions of Gemma. I'll introduce uh, Jane Steer, who's created a tool that's called uh, WET, and he'll share that with you. Um, it's about water science, and you can look at that by Rohi or the freshwater area. So, <coughs> without further ado, I'll um, introduce Jane Steer. Take away. Thanks, Joe. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Jane Steer. I'm an environmental scientist here at the council. Um, so, as you're probably pretty aware by now, uh, there's been lots of work going on with regard to the National Policy Statement for Freshwater Management, uh, and that required a great deal of work from the, the science team in terms of taking all of our, our monitoring programs and monitoring sites and trying to analyse them and trying to figure out exactly where we are relative to these uh, national guidelines that have been put out through the NPS. Um, so, in this there are a number of reports that come out of this and one such report required us to do exactly that um, and as you can imagine by the time we add up uh, all of these individual sites and um, all of the monitoring programs and trying to analyze that we end up with a a very very large report with a um, with a very big appendix um, and that started to get us to think hang on uh, how many people are actually going to interact with the data that's stored in this appendix. I mean, this is important stuff for the likes of, of uh, groups like yourselves and further stakeholders and even the, uh, the general public in our community. So we started to think about uh, ways to make this interactive, um, allow the public to sort of get involved and to try and better understand this stuff. So we came up with what we call the water ecology tool, which I'm gonna show you in a, in a couple of minutes. Um, and essentially what this does is take all of those tables that were at the back of our appendix and makes it into a website that is freely available and is available in the agenda 
Um, so you can go through that and you can explore our region and you can find out exactly uh, the state of all of these, these different rivers and lakes and um, in terms of the ecology and the streams and all of that kind of stuff. So um, hopefully this school will uh, engage the public more and, and groups like yourself and, and yeah, get more people involved with our research than um, previously. So uh, what I'll do is I will share it and to just take you through and show you how to navigate this tool. James, I'll um, paste a, a link to it into the chat on Zoom. So if anyone wants to have a play while you're watching James show you around, you can have a look too. Thanks, John. Appreciate it. Right, so this is what we've got up here. Um, this is the, the front loading page, which just has a bit of information about exactly what all of this data is and how it fits into to our values as a council. Um, if you scroll down, there are a number of links through here. So there's information on the indicators that we're actually looking at, what they mean, and um, <coughs> that's through to the environmental data portal, which has a whole lot of uh, our data that goes up live. Um, and then we have links through to uh, the National Policy Statement for Freshwater Management and also snapshots of rivers and, and lakes. So it's, it really is a, a way to understand what we're doing. Um, if you scroll down further, you can see all of the sites that we monitor routinely across all different programs. Um, and you can start to understand why this report would have been completely unwieldy. So, um, then what you can actually do is come up and scroll through to the map page. And what this allows you to do, firstly, it um, brings up a map of our region and you can determine the data set that you're interested in. So river water quality, vaping water quality, uh, all the way down to lakes TLI at the bottom. Uh, you can view by, so if you scroll over the top, you can see that we have our, our freshwater management units there that you can understand which, um, which sites are present in each of those. But not only that, you can actually view by priority. Um, so one thing with this is that because there are so many overlaps between different priority um, boundaries, we don't show them all together. What we actually do is, is uh, have a drop down box here where you can select exactly what you're interested in, um, and then this will, will bring a little uh, boundary up. So, let me just go back to virtual management units. And um, what you can see here is that we have our, our list of indicators. So, these are all indicators that are present in the national policy statement. And you can scroll down to one. I'm just going to show you suspended fine sediment. And you can determine we have all of the outputs that we've got in there. So we've got our, our baseline state. So that's the state at the 1st of January 2017. Um, and then we also have um, our current state, which is the most recent data that we have available. And so if I put on the current state overall band, then you can see we start to get colors to all of those dots, which tell us, according to this particular indicator, uh, which category does it sit in, or how, how what's the state of these particular sites? Um, once you go through further down, we've got other information. So you have um, trend is also quite useful to look at the trends of um, of that particular indicator across the region. And these are all, I mean, this is the statistical output that we have. Um, so there's more information in, in our report about exactly what those trends mean. Um, and then one thing that you can actually do, say we're interested in the Kaituna, you can click on the Kaituna and that will bring it up and you can go through to the table tab through here. Uh, and this will bring up, you can select your site, so it will come up with a list of all of the sites in the Kaituna. Um, and that has now populated a table where if you're interested in the actual numbers that sit underneath all of this, it's all there available for you. Um, 
one thing to note with this is that you can also download this table, which we wanted to make sure that anyone who's interested in this is able to download the, the data and to manipulate it in the way that they want to. So this is not the raw data, this is processed by us, <coughs> but you are able to interact with this summarized data. Um, so aside from all of that, we also have a tab which may look a little bit confusing at first, but it gives you a, an overall summary of um, our trends for a particular attribute. So here we have ammonia, and we can see these ones at the top are worsening, and the extent they move away from this middle line, from the zero, um, reflects how much they're moving, so the percentage annual change. So these ones up here are kind of your higher priority in terms of addressing this particular attribute. And these ones down here are actually going the opposite direction and by quite a significant magnitude as well. Finally, we have a page on um, notes and definitions that just help people through it. So um, I, I encourage everybody to, to uh, go and have a look at this and to, um, to fire back any questions that you've got. We're more than happy to take you through. Are there any questions? Just on the trends analysis, um, how, how long have you been collecting that data for? And, and all those indicators, are you are you actually collecting data currently for all those indicators? Yeah, yeah. So the first thing is that every attribute in the MPS has a, um, a defined timeline. So we would give it a category of A through to D based on whatever the MPS says. And that is, in most cases, it is a single year. Um, but it could be up to up to five years. When we do our trend analysis, um, if you've ever had anything to do with trends, you trends can be quite affected by climatic variability. Um, so if you have a particular wet period that may last five years, then you can get quite poor trends. Um, if you have a particular dry period, you may sort of get a really good trend output. So what we want to do is include more information. Um, so what we've done is include 10 years of data feeding into all of those trends for every attribute where we have that amount of data available. If we don't have that amount of data available, we may have known in there that, yes, this is the trend, but hang on, um, we don't actually have a full 10 year data set in there. Just to follow up, um, did, did you only have four sites on the Kaituna, or is that right, or is it more than that? Uh, and just, uh, Oh no, just answer that, sorry, and I'll just got a little another quick follow up. Sure. So the slides that you see on the Kaituna, this is part of our, <laughs> our national monitoring network. So um, yes, you're correct. We have within the FMU for river water quality, it looks like we have uh, four sites as part of our Newman monitoring network. So this is the, the monthly monitoring. However, there is a, there are a lot of other programs that are taking place that are not displayed on this. This is used for reporting at a national level. Um, we also have a lot of investigations led by PIMS teams um, that are collecting a whole lot more information around there. And so that's that's separate to this. My last question, um, and it relates back to Tataru's comment earlier about um, not duplicating and knowing what everyone's doing and keeping close to the to the kaupapa and mahi. Um, the Wairi Kaitiaki Advisory Group, um, you know, a lot of their um, being, I suppose, is, is about monitoring the, the Awa, and it seems like there's a really good opportunity to feed what you're doing into, into their um, studies and research uh, in terms of these specific monitoring sites uh, around the Tarama City Water Supply Project, especially. Has that been? Uh, has there been any work between the two entities? Not <coughs> that I'm aware of. Um, however, I know that there are a number of programs that are, are very similar, um, and people are only just starting to realise that this information is, is available to them. So, mm -hmm. the more we can get this out, and the more that we can make people aware that this is this is there, and this is what the region looks like, the better, I think.
I can just add to your answer on that one. Yeah, there has been a lot of data sharing between regional council and the city council in the Waiati, um, but the sites that are covered in the water ecology tool that James has just outlined, um, there were none of those in the in the Waiati um, above the intake. So it's data from more specific investigations that that's been shared rather than those long running um, trend sites. Does that make sense? Yep. Uh, yep. Here, I might add too that um, uh, as James has mentioned, he's working on the science in the water. Um, Gina Mohi was here and she's obviously had to take off, but she's working on the Mahinga Kai and the Matauranga Māori part of it. So she is aware of the Waiari Iwi Kaitiaki group and keeping uh, tabs on what they're doing and, and will feed into them and vice versa. She's also working with the Bartaka Kai project as well, same sort of thing as sharing as caring, I guess, and making sure that we're using that information rather than replicating it. Yeah, that's a point that I was going to touch on, that, that uh, it's about the, that whole description of uh, Modi, the life force of water, and the, and of course, what affects, why is the, the birds not going in certain places, why are the fish not going in certain places? That's the, the, the life force because of the changing. What's going to ha happen when the, the, the new global warming comes into, into, into play? All, all these are important matters because the life force or the landscape, if I ask you the question, why are there no frogs around? Is there something wrong with the water? And you just quite haven't answered that. You've identified spots on, on the landscape, but uh, the causes of the, the, the life force of the water. I suppose, James, um, just so I'm wondering whether the uh, water ecology tool would be useful within the within that part of the catchment, the Waiari, but um, yeah, thank you. Any other questions for James or my team? Just one last comment, um, and I was really interested in your comments about the long-term trend analysis and, and not sort of um, getting too um, sidetracked by short-term numbers, and um, and that's also um, a concern on the Wairi Water Supply Project, I think, because we have had a... Um, a prolonged dry period just recently. So, so your uh, methodology and, and extrapolating it into longer term trends is quite interesting, I think. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm sorry, Tatadu here. Oh, yes. Can I can I can I ask what people are, are seeing as longer term? What's that? Um, it's yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, generally, in New Zealand, most councils are reporting trends uh, on a 10 yearly basis, and the reason behind that is that it provides trend information that is still relevant, um, so that we can see whether things whether we've got <coughs> changes in the catchment that we can still uh, do something about. Um, but it also sort of goes beyond that variability that occurs short term because of, um, say, an El Nino period or, or something like that. Um, what you could do, I mean, different lengths of uh, data and trends run over them give you different bits of information. If you ran it over the entire data set, you would have um, an overall, so sometimes the entire data set can span 25, 30 years. Uh, if you ran it over that, you, you may get um, a positive trend, for example, but then, or a negative trend, but then it may not be, you, it would be more difficult to change that trend than if you were to do it over a 10-year period. So it really depends on, on your objective for those trends. And in this particular case, most councils have decided that a 10-year trend 
reported in the likes of this and the likes of Lawa um, is, is the most appropriate. Yeah, no, thank you for that. Um, I, I guess I'm just caught up in the um, in, in the in the sea level change um, debate and um, and what sort of uh, analysis is done in the context of investment today, and what the value will be um, in the in the potential changing trends of sea level rise. That's what. Hmm. Could um, can I that? just add? Sorry, can I just add that? This, this tool is perhaps the second iteration that we've come up with, um, but we're always after new ideas and feedback. And we envision sort of as in being an iterative process that we, we make this include more and more things and eventually address more and more people and more and more ideas. So yeah, any feedback is, is much appreciated. Mm, thank you. Is there no other questions for this team? Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Uh, we'll, we'll move on to uh, 10.3. Well, actually, I'll, I'll move the report be received and answer on the second. Thank you, Brian. <coughs> uh, 10.3, the Kotona Catchment Control Scheme Advisory Group, an update. Kirsty. Okay. Um... Oh, Here we Apologies, can you hear me? Uh, yes. Thanks. Um, so, tēnā I'm Kirsty Brown and I'm the Rivers and Drainage Assets Manager at Tuimuana. And one of my areas of responsibility is looking after our River Scheme Advisory Groups. Um, which provides rate payer input into the management of our flood protection schemes. Um, I'd like to refer you to page 60 in your agenda. This report has been created to improve the communication flow between the Kaituna Catchment Advisory Group and Te Maru o Kaituna um, by providing high level overview of key topics from the advisory group's recent meetings um, and this is a vice versa. We are providing the advisory groups um, a high level report of key topics discussed at your meetings. So this report is from um, the advisory group meeting held on the 4th of April. So I'd like to take the report as read and just open up for questions or any comments. Hi, yes. Kirsty. Hi, Pam. Come here, your, your colleague. Yes. Um, <laughs> I'm really pleased that you're here because I think, yeah. you know, having sort of been across both forums, and I see Councillor Denise has got her hand up, which is great. I, I think it's it's excellent that the um, that the river scheme work is brought to the attention of Timaru because I think it is central to the achievement of the action plan and the river document. Um, so um, I think maybe you've been unlucky to be at the at the end of the agenda, but um, no, it's, it's good that you're here and keep keep bringing those um, tucky those projects that you're working on. And where you think there might be issues that are perhaps inconsistent with the document or the action plan, um, just 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 make, make sure that that um, members are aware of those as we go forward. Um, you know, there's there's a reason why you do these things. Um, to keep the grass growing, et cetera, et cetera. But it's always good to have the corridor together. So thanks. Not a problem. Jane, Jane do you have a question? Uh, no, I, no, not a question, just a comment. Um, I did attend the last meeting, and I think it perhaps was Nick that mentioned that um, members of the advisory group were also welcome to come and um, attend tomorrow meetings and they were going to be advised of the dates of the tomorrow meetings mm -hmm. um, so that there would be more discussion between the groups. Um, but I, what I did want to bring to people's attention um, was that the Ford Road pump station is often a very big topic of conversation. Um, 
with the um, the ratepayers into the scheme. It's been a very long um, standing project and there have been a number of delays in it and council in the annual plan um, previous to this one um, actually had submissions from the um, the advisory group asking to change the rating uh, share because the costs were escalating on the river on the actual Ford Road pump station and they were very concerned that had they been able to do the project when it was first projected, it would have cost them a lot less and every delay is costing them a lot mm -hmm. of money, um, particularly now with construction and inflation. Um, so I guess um, just noting that there are delays in the cultural impact assessments, just bringing that to um, people's attention around the, um, the table that time is money. And I think those advisory group members would be very grateful to have the process expedited. Thank you, Jane. Um, I think uh, at the last tomorrow meeting, I may have been appointed to this group. And I don't think I went because I had something else. I think we were opening up um, uh, Hepuna Manawa here in the city. And so um, I gave my apologies for this. Um, However, because I was uh, going to give a, uh, I suppose, an update and a bit of a presentation to uh, this committee as well from from Tabaru's uh, perspective, um, I, I certainly believe that uh, we should be working together, especially around drainage. Uh, I did a kind of a quick count in my head. I think there's around about 120 drains at least in the lower catchment of the Kaitana. And each one of them uh, probably needs uh, some sort of um, assessment on, on whether they could be better, whether they, whether the drains can do a better job than what they currently, and if they can, what should those drains look like? And so, a bit of a conversation I've had with um, others around, and, and I think uh, for tomorrow we've had actually a presentation from a landowner who gave us a, an insight into what a drain could look like. And so there was a bit of a conversion of farmland into something else with my land. And uh, so th there are definitely ideas, I think, around how we could, um, I suppose, um, approach drains and what the, whether they look like more riparian, I suppose, in, in nature. And uh, with the Pataka Kai, one of the outcomes of that project is to identify areas for fish passages or fish Sherries. And uh, I did raise with them whether drains would be an area to look at. And that if you are um, going to look possibly at uh, fish passages, maybe increasing um, the, the suitability of drains for fish life and using that as a mode indicator. Uh, so um, I think there's definitely a lot that we can talk about collectively. And uh, just to I suppose, make the point, I mean, that is the reason why Tamaru was established, so that we all work together uh, and uh, to, for, for the catchment. So that, that would be all I have to say at this point, but uh, thank you, Kirsty, for uh, sharing and, um, and everyone else. Are there any other? Oh, okay, the hands are up. Um, we have Grant and then Manu. Yes, so just wanted to, I mean, I, I know John is, is on this group as well, but um, I, I noticed the um, bullet point to Pocky Stormwater in, in your report, Kirsty, and I'm not sure whether you or Tim might be best to give an update on this, but in light of um, to Pocky being identified as in, a, in the tier one growth area for the RMA reform on medium density residential, um, uh, programs for intensification and um, and and the amount of residential development that is in the pipeline we've got like probably another 1200 houses being built in the next 10 years possibly um, within the Tapuki urban area and I, I know the stormwater has always been an issue to accommodate this growth so I was just wondering if, if you possibly could give an update on, on where we're up to to um, 
to to accommodate that growth and more QSD. Yes, of course. Um, so the Tapuvi Stormwater Project um, sits within the engineering team. Um, so that's Mark Townsend's area. Um, but a, just a bit of an update. Um, so <coughs> the modelling um, part of the capacity review has now been completed. Um, and the next, it's now moved into the next stage, um, looking at possible options to mitigate. So overall, the report, the modelling report found that yes, um, development in Tapuki has had a significant effect um, to the scheme and with the extra stormwater. Um, yeah. I can't give you sort of um, timelines, um, but I could ask um, for more information from engineering if you think that would be helpful. Um, yes, always helpful. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm not sure how, I mean, as a council at Western Bay, obviously, some of this work is, is in our um, capital programs as well, but um, there's obviously some work that regional council will need to be doing as well. So good yes. to understand how it all fits together. Yeah, I understand that the modelling report um, has been approved both by um, Western Bay District Council and ourselves. <coughs> and then they're currently sort of scoping um, with Western Bay um, around the optioneering stage and the possible um, mitigation or solutions to offset any adverse effects from development in Tapuki on the scheme. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, uh, I wonder if your report goes looks further enough down the, the line. Uh, in the future, our sewage, our, our sewage will probably have to be turned to compost. And uh, compost, if you have rich compost, then <coughs> it can uh, go back into the economics by providing, no mind about the green party and all that, they will go back and make rich crops. And that's taking the, uh, the uh, sewage that's been affected, the water waves and things like that. And then there's the riparian. The riparian is talking about the beans from going into the rivers. If you grew uh, a whole lot of middle trees alongside the river, then the kiridu will become a pest, and you don't have to rely on Kentucky Bright Chicken. Um, you know, these these sort of things that need to be doing this protection of the, the waterways. Yeah. And it should be a, a, a critical part in, in your, your planning for the future. It, it definitely is. Um, and PIM's team has been, um, <coughs> you know, working with some, we've been working with some ideas. Um, the main thing for the schemes is being able to maintain the assets. So they, you know, provide their level of service. Um, so we need to, sort of develop a plan around how we can have that riparian planting as well as continuing our maintenance works required. Um, for example, you know, being able to access a drain to desilt it when it gets clogged up. Um, and so we have had numerous conversations around the team, best ways to do that. And we have sort of come up with some some good ideas about the types of plantings, um, having spaces, gaps, so machine can access the drains and things like that. So it is very much something we are keen to support as well. Um, you know, there's benefits from riparian planting for flood protection and maintenance of drains. For example, the shade can reduce weed growth. Um, yeah, so we're very supportive in that area and work behind the scenes is being carried out. 
Thank you, Kirsty. I think we're very supportive too of any of the types of ideas that come through and being yeah. able to be able to share those, especially the traditional ones that uh, Manu is uh, speaking about. And then the uh, sewage. Um, it's an opportunity so, to investigate. Yes, it is an opportunity. Um, I must admit we haven't considered sewerage. Um, it's not something we usually deal well deal with in the flood protection area, but we could um, definitely look into that. Dewaterizing it and turn it into rich compost. Yes. Mm. Yeah. We're definitely on a journey um, with flood protection, um, sustainability, using green infrastructure instead of the usual hard engineering, making room for the rivers. And it, it's quite an exciting space um, for someone like myself who's been working with the um, in the flood protection space for a long time. It's quite heartening to see that we're moving away from, you know, just building stock banks and using rock and looking at alternatives like wetlands and riparian plantings. Uh, Kirsty, um, so do you have a question? I see your hands up. Oh yeah, sorry. Yeah, just, just a quick one, Kirsty. Um, obviously one of the big developments that's in proximity to the Kaituna catchment is the um, industrial park at Rangiuru. And there'll be some significant draining issues to be addressed there, okay. draining issues. Are we, yes. I'm assuming we, you're, you're pretty, or the group is pretty close to, to that space at the moment? Yes, that's correct. So um, that is sitting in our engineering team as well. Um, and they have been talking quite closely with the business park um, as part of their resource consent application. Um, I can't provide too much detail there, but um, again, I can approach the engineering team for a bit of an update. Yeah, I'm just assuming that you're close to the action and um, whatever, um, you, 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 you've got a, a good eye on, on that work. Yeah, no, they definitely yeah. marks yeah. on the job there, so yeah. Any other members got any questions for Kirsty? Uh, thank you, Kirsty. Uh, been enlightening. Uh, thank you. Okay, um, I'll just like to move the report. Can I have someone second? Are we? Okay, Kia ora. Thank you. Um, Point 11 uh, is a uh, consideration of um, items not on the agenda, which we don't have any. Uh, and that brings us to an end for today's meeting. Um, uh, we, we're going to break and have a bit of a cup of tea, those of us here. Um, we have shared Rawson has turned up to give us a bit of a talk around, um, uh, I suppose, the legislative requirements, I suppose, that the government's moving towards in regards to water and that. Uh, so that's going to be Zoomed, and I think, are we, it's a different link. It's a different link. So uh, if you're keen to be part of that, I suppose, um, you can link into that. Already done? Okay, so, so we're going to post this new link after we have a bit of a cry and a bite, and then uh, those of you who want to can use that link, is my understanding. I see you are end up to Tali, so... Yeah, sorry, you want more, yeah, yeah, more sorry detail. To, sorry, <laughs> sorry to be a whole heart. Hey, look, um, in the future, at some point, I, I would really like to get, get um, you know, some speaker or some intelligence or research around the table around um, the impacts of sea level rise in the context of, of the Kaituna catchment. I think that's really, really a significant issue as we plan forward. So someone, somehow, somewhere can give us a download on, on, on a perspective in that space, that would be great. Uh, we we uh, have newer involved with that project that they do, so maybe I'll, I'll touch base with them mm. and see if they can come back to us uh, maybe on the next agenda, 
I, I'm forced to say aware that I think we only have one more meeting this year because it's been a local election year. Um, there may be two, I'm not sure, but uh, I think there's at least one. So I can try and get them on that agenda to give us an update around their perspectives, I suppose, in regards to um, sea level rise within, uh, within well, Bay of Plenty probably, but uh, certainly the coastal mm -hmm. area. Yeah, because basically my understanding really, um, uh, Dean, oh, yeah. is that, Dean, is that it's not just about, you know, how it might uh, affect the plains, but also has impacts on the rivers and how they behave. And that goes right back to their source, so headwater sources. So everything is impacted by sea level rise. So I'm really, really interested in Niwa's views or whoever's views. So thanks for that, mate. Appreciate it. Uh, Scott Stevens is the guy who will get in from Niwa. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Uh, Jeff, Jeff, would you like to close us? Okay, copy. Ta ta ta. Hui. We done. Right. Right. Ah, uh, kia tau, kia tau kato, kia tau fire to ta ta wari kia u karaiti. Te aroa me te atu me te fifi na tahi tanga ki te wairu e tapu. Ake, ake, ake. Amen. Kia ora. Amen. Amen. Hey, get out of that. Yeah, cool.